Welcome to Roundhouse Roulette, a Walker, Texas Ranger podcast. Each week we recap and review one of the 200 existing Walker, Texas Ranger episodes randomly selected by Roundhouse Roulette. I'm Evan Dalton, here with my brother Adam. What's up? And the Washoe to our Black Fox and Coyote duo, Mr. Bob Leahy. Greetings and salutations to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd like to thank you all for joining us as we witness Chuck Norris playing savior to the Cherokee Nation yet again. <laughs> Today, we will recap and review Season 6, Episode 13, Tribe, where Walker helps a love-struck childhood friend out of a very tricky situation. Mm. Mm. <laughs> but uh, before we mosey on over to Cape Broke Shoulders and pile on a stack of hotcakes, join us as we pull up a stool at CD's Bar and Grill. Hey, fancy meeting you guys here. Yeah, man, it's been two weeks. It feels like a long time since we threw down this podcast. Well, speaking of things that are sort of overdue or something that we really want to get into... We've got this lovely beer here. Yeah, now, so CD, he's procured this interesting beverage for this week's episode. Uh, it doesn't look like something he would normally have on tap, um, but I'm intrigued. Yes, this is the Citra Revengeance, a hazy double India pale ale. And uh, this is a collaborative brewing opportunity led up by Mason Ale Works. They're actually in San Marcos, California, and the uh, Beer Zombies Brewing Company, and I think they're somewhere in Nevada. <laughs> okay, best, best I can do here. Okay, yeah. well, um, <laughs> yeah, the the bar menu isn't that specific this week, but uh. mm, mm. also not much of a description here. Although, okay. let's face it. Uh, it's an IPA and it has citra in its name. So my guess is that they used citra hops. And it looks like there's like a zombie hop whose hands are melting away to the bone on this. I'm kind of scared about this one. This one's, uh, you know. It's, uh, it's good can art, though. Yeah. Yeah. It's like sort of old school weird tattoo art. Yeah. And as Adam said, it's a zombie with a hop cone for a beard. Hmm. Uh, holding decomposing hands up to its face. This could go into the theme of the episode, which uh, may uh, involve some revenge. Um, or may not. We'll, we'll have to find out. Well, let's crack this thing up and... Um, let's see how the sucker tastes. <laughs> yeah, well, it smells very fruity. This is good. This is good. This actually is not as aggressive as I thought it would be from the can art. Yeah, it's, it's it smells very fruity, but it actually tastes very piney. And uh, is not bitter, really, at all. It's really chill. For one that has a zombie with his hands being melted off on the front of the can, I'm not feeling that. You look through it, though. You see, I got a lot of floaties in mine. It could be like the zombie's flesh. <laughs> I hope so. Definitely. It's, it is chewy. It tastes a little decomposing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he was buried in a pine box. Oh, there you go. That's the best way to be buried. So I've been told. Bury me in a pine box with a bunch of hops. There it is. Just let it ferment. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> this is going to be an interesting episode as we decompose this bevy. Mm, chilling. Before we get into the socials and uh, news and whatnot, I think we have to talk about Bob's mystery machine encounter. Oh, I saw it again today. <laughs> so can you describe what you, you texted us? Uh, recently, Bob, what what did you witness? So I lived in an apartment building, and there's a uh, parking garage <laughs> that I park in right next door. And um, came back one night, and there's this van parked all by itself, <laughs> off in the distance. And um, there's a very stunning painting on the side of this van. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll say. I mean, and so this is like a white econoline esque van chilling the furthest away you can get in the parking garage like intentionally you yeah. know shitty yeah, like, drug deal kind of thing or or yeah usually in this parking garage you'd see ve you know vehicles that are just they they appear to be abandoned uh, <laughs> and actually when i got up to this one it kind of looked abandoned because uh there's no plates on it 
<laughs> yeah, I noticed that. I was <laughs> like, I was like, oh, we might be able to share the photos because there's no plate on it. So, and without plates, I was thinking maybe this is up for grabs. <laughs> <laughs> but has it moved? Uh, yes, it has. So since uh, then, so <laughs> I actually looked. I didn't send the picture of this, but on the front there was a little note that said getting inspected tomorrow or something like please don't tow <laughs> oh, okay 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 so i think a, i think a band must have picked this up huh it could be a band <sighs> getting I mean, inspected could. getting inspected this this is the type of thing where like a, a tow company if you were talking with your other tow truck buddies right you know, you you guys would talk about bagging this thing as like the <laughs> the unicorn you yeah. know? <laughs> uh, let me show you the pictures of the one i picked up today i know they're like oh, check yeah. this one out <laughs> <laughs> yeah so on the on the driver's side there's like a i don't know if this is airbrushed or it's close to airbrushed right <laughs> No, if you, when you get up close, it looks like it's actually like painted, like hand painted. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't have the same feel as airbrushed. It, it's like a a mural on the inside of a Mexican restaurant. Okay, oh, so they exactly have like an eagle on the yeah. driver's side door with like a cowboy on a horse. Is that with a sword? Is, is it a cowboy? It, it no, might be. A, it might a be Native a American. Native American oh, okay. with a headdress and a rifle. Yeah. That's exactly okay. what it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's on one side. It's kind of a Western scape. And mm-hmm. on the yeah. back, totally different vibe. And this is when I realized there was no license plate looking at the back <laughs> of this. I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. It's kind of like a under under the water, uh, maybe like oh, yeah. a pond. No, no. I, it's like a coral reef, man. They got a marlin and they yeah. got like some, some fish. They got some hammerhead sharks. Yeah. It's interesting they chose to change up the vibe for the back, mm. you know. Yeah, yeah. You you can actually see some of the spray over from the spray paint they used around the windows. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can. <laughs> and then on the other side, they decide <laughs> to go even further back in time. And this is probably the best, the best side, right? I mean, oh, it's a definitely. whole dinoscape. Yeah. There's like a brontosaurus, a pterodactyl flying over like a volcano with the sun going down. Dude, it's um, not that's not a brontosaurus. It's that's a plesiosaur that looks like the Loch, Loch Ness monster. Okay, uh, what, whatever. <laughs> it's know. a it's in the water, dude. <laughs> yeah, brontosaurus could go in the water if it wanted to. If it was shallow enough, I think those things would sink. But okay, didn't the brontosaurus? Didn't- Someone said that that actually didn't exist, or what we thought was a brontosaurus. Mm, yes, it's, it's now called else. an apatosaurus, I believe. Okay. Although yes. they've probably gone back. It's like, you know, it's like us learning Pluto was a planet, and then everyone telling us that it's a dwarf planet, and that there are only eight planets now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like That's why now. you can't trust anybody when they say something, you know? Like, right. So, it's like, like science out there. Yeah, you can't believe science. Right. Don't, no, Look, don't believe changes. anything you hear. That's right. that's what I live by. Don't believe anything yep. you hear, and don't ever trust yourself. Right. That way you'll never be disappointed. It's true. Words to live by. That said, rest in peace, Brontosaurus. Rest in peace, Pluto. Pluto. Yeah. Okay. All right. Pour, Pour one, one out. out. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and what I love about this van too is they left like white space of the actual van. Like it doesn't like it's not like they covered it completely. And just for reference, like this reminded me, our buddy Sky shared <laughs> an article about Russian airbrushing. There's a whole like scene about Russians airbrushing their cars and trucks, and there's an amazing airbrush of Chuck Norris on the side of a Dodge Ram in Russia. And just for reference, I put that up here alongside it. Mm. Kind of a similar style. They kind pretty, of, uh, you know what I mean? It's a pretty close vibe. Yeah. And they left a lot of the white space of the truck mm-hmm. and just kind of popped them on there. That's kind of what this guy did on his, you know, rock van. Yeah, the Ramception, Chuck Norris. <laughs> yeah. I'll put these up here on the episode page for people to check out because I think this is art that needs to be appreciated. Yeah. I think we should also say that on the back of the I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom in. Enhance. Enhance. It's a Chevy uh I don't know what. It's like a nineties Chevy van. Okay. With with yeah. no real windows on the side. Uh it we'll sketch it. Yeah, there's a signature on the back. It looks like it says Lula. I'm Googling this right now. Really? Lula airbrush Well, I did see it today. It's on the lower level, though, which tells me that the person may not live in my building. Just so you know, when I Google search Lula airbrush car, the first image that comes up is Chuck Norris on that Dodge. (laughs) Unbelievable. 
Uh, what what are you saying? Like, yeah, what's the connection here? What is I don't same know. Artist? <laughs> there's the same. There's an artist in Russia who traveled to Lowell, <laughs> Massachusetts, it's, to do this guy's van. Uh, I mean, it Maybe. certainly seems so. But like I said, this is. I don't think the van is airbrushed. Okay. It well, it looked. I think maybe it, part of it. You, know, you leave, know. Bob. You leave your phone number on the van. On the van, you say, "Hey, look, we just talked about your van on the podcast. We'd love to have you on. We kind of want to know. We need to hear the <laughs> this story. Could be our first in-person <laughs> guest. It could be. <laughs> so you're telling me I should just leave my information, like my apartment number, and just like tell them that they should no, just come. No, they don't have to go up to your apartment. You know you the person in this van is probably going to kill me. Look at the van and think about what we just said. Yeah, but if if you were like going to be kidnapped, I'd really like to be kidnapped in that van. That's a pretty good van for that. Oh van. yeah, well, I don't think I don't think, I don't think we said anything compromising about it. No, not at all. We couldn't even read off the license plate. It does have a plate now. I saw it today. All right. Well, I found someone named Lula Smith on Facebook who claims that they've worked in cars, they've worked in airbrush, but this person's in Utah. That said, this car. Could have come from Utah. Yeah, they could have picked I mean, it up, or who knows? It's, it's pretty clean given the age. I don't see a lot of rust, so it could be imported. Yeah, they might have actually you know. picked it up because they got a good deal on it, and it just happened to have that stuff on the side. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, which is in itself amazing. Which so if we get the person on the podcast, I'm like, yeah, I just bought this fan. I have no idea. Yeah, that's all we They're need. Like, I have an appointment say, okay. to get it painted. Okay. Okay. All right. Can you keep us posted on the uh, on the updated paint job? I'll you know I'll do my best. I mean it's just it's just a totally epic van. It's a, I mean it's a great van. I would love to. I would love to. I mean because it was empty and appeared abandoned, I did take a peek inside. There's nothing in there. So all right, I'll definitely leave that in. There wasn't like someone duct taped inside. No, that's kind of what I was <laughs> oh, checking checking for. To be honest. <laughs> I mean, no windows. Look, you can see the back is all. Um, yeah. What, was there any duct tape on the in the front seat or zip ties? No, I mean, I didn't. I didn't look too closely. I was just looking for obvious signs of you know murder or anything <laughs> okay. sinister. So. No tarps. Nope. No. No tarps. Yeah, no, not pa- much of anything really. Yeah, the pavement looks pretty clean around the the van. Okay. All right. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that, I th- we just had to touch on that because that van was so epic. But That's let's great. move on to the socials here. Previously, we heard from Katie Robb on Facebook. She took us to task about missing out on Chuck Norris's son being in some of the episodes. She hit us back and let us know that we actually missed him again in Blown Apart. And Jeez. what blew my mind was as she's been working her way through our back catalog here at Roundhouse Roulette, she decided to rewatch the show in the same order as our podcast. Nice. We've got a convert. Yeah, which I don't know, besides Kenny, if anyone else has been doing that. So This is kind of like how people rewatch all the Marvel Universe movies, and there are different ways of doing it. We're the, we're the Walker style. Yeah. So shout out to her for going at it via <laughs> the uh, roundhouse order. So. Also, shame on us for not realizing that Chuck Norris would only ever actually um, give his son, Mike Norris, the incredibly awesome role of Dean Watkins. <laughs> of Dean Watkins' white pickup fame. Yeah, of right. Dean Watkins' white pickup. One can only assume that the white pickup in Russia with Chuck Norris airbrushed on the side is actually Dean Watkins' white pickup. That's possible. Dean Watkins flight pickup. It's possible. I mean, that guy probably changed his name to Dean Watkins. I think it's a good name for a band, too, you know? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Dean Watkins is so obscure, no one would ever get the reference. Nope. I think someone would search hashtag Dean Watkins white pickup and end up on the uh, <laughs> on the blown us. apart Roundhouse Roulette webpage and wonder yeah. why they're there. <laughs> Which, blown apart, again, I think it's our highest rated episode so far, but maybe we'll beat it this week. We'll see. Possible. Our previous podcast was on the episode Mustangs, in which Walker attempts to tame Santana, the leader of the Wild Mustangs. And uh, boy, did he ever, right, guys? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, sure did. No man can ride Santana, but um, 
Yeah, but Walker sure did. Mm. And he actually was able to tame Santana just in time to save Santana's herd from a pack of renegade meat packers. So, <laughs> hashtag renegade meat packers. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag all in the day's work. Uh, but we heard from Samuel Campbell on Facebook, and he said, I can't picture myself eating horse meat because I blow chunks at the side of that. I mean, don't knock until you try it. Yeah. I mean, the world is full of people like Samuel Campbell. And by that, I mean naysayers. Okay. Oh, All right. Okay. That's All right. All right. That's so I guess Evan eats horse meat. <laughs> okay. Um, what, <laughs> what, what we heard uh, from our friend Mondo from the Talented Slackers, Evan, you had questioned if all Texans have gloves in the glove box and a lasso <laughs> Uh, in the front seat because that's what Walker just randomly had one conveniently in the front seat. It was it, very convenient, but it, you know he's pretty prepared. He is a Texas Ranger. I was just curious if people other than Texas Rangers had that kind of gear. And we, not being Texans, were putting it out there for any Texans that wanted to reach out. And I said that's a state law in Texas, so we have to have gloves in the glove box, lasso in the trunk or back seat, and an assault rifle as well, which I believe. In a state charter, <laughs> I believe, yeah. I think that tracks. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> this past week, the craziest thing happened. I took a lift to the airport here in Nashville, and I was picked up by this guy. He was asking me about what I was doing, you know, during the pandemic. And, of course, I was like, you know Walker, Texas Ranger? And he's like, oh, yeah, boy, do I ever. So I started telling him about the podcast, and... You're never going to believe it, but he actually used to live in Massachusetts. He goes, yeah, I actually, my family used to vacation in Martha's Vineyard, and Walker's partner, he actually had a house right next to us, a summer house there, and he used to go rollerblading with Clarence Gilliard and Clarence Gilliard's kids on Martha's Vineyard. Sign of the times, huh? Yeah, rollerblades. So that was pretty random, but he's like kind of asking about the podcast i was telling him how we do all the stats like explosions we chart roundhouse kicks vehicle chases he's like you mean ram chases ram i said actually uh as we're digging into these episodes he had a gmc the first season and then we've even seen him in a flashback rocking el camino Mm -hmm. and then he and he's in the front seat and i'm in the back seat he's like see he's like dude you're like an expert man He's like, that's "That's awesome. He's like, I kind of want to do that for the show Highlander. And then he's like going into all these like Highlander stats and like, he's just as passionate about Highlander. So he hit us up on the social medias and I want to give a shout out to Colin Walsh and I'm charging him with starting his own Highlander podcast right here, right now. Should we start a production company and bring him under our umbrella? Oh, we could. Yeah. I think That'd you be- guys should. But I I think if he is going to do a podcast, he has to have somebody on the podcast, either himself or somebody else, who just um, speaks like, what is it, Chris Lambert the entire time? It's just this really weird accent. <laughs> he <laughs> needs like the, someone Scottish. Yeah, but his accent is so strange. It's like, I, I can't even do it. I don't, it's, Yeah. <laughs> it's like someone, <laughs> yeah it's yeah. like a, a robot trying to do an american accent <laughs> it's really strange all right all right well this is it this might be the start of it here but colin you're the man and it was good talking with you and we're charging you right now to get this started um but you know if you're looking to join the uh, roundhouse roulette podcast network um <laughs> hit us up too so well we've got a lot to cover this week <laughs> <laughs> so let's get on into it. If you're watching along at home and do not want any spoilers, hit that pause button and watch season six, episode 13, Tribe. And after you're done, please come back to us. Welcome back. You guys ready for this? Oh, man, mm-hmm. am I ever. Mm-hmm. This episode originally aired January 3rd, 1998, and it opens at an archaeological dig site on the Cherokee Nation Reservation. Mm, yeah, I mean, at least they put up a few pop-up tents, you know. That <laughs> There's kind of some thing. rope tied around some, <laughs> some little stakes, right? That, yeah. that makes you think that it's yeah. legit. 
Mm. To quote Jurassic Park founder John Hammond, they spared no expense. Oh, well, yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> Um, but they did have rope tied off, like they were kind of into rows, like they were sifting, and they're like, well, this was found here, and that kind of thing. And you're like, oh, okay, this doesn't look too scientific, but yeah, yeah sure, it's close enough. Mm. Yeah, no, there's a woman, and she's using some form of paintbrush to isolate a rock from the surrounding strata. and um, Exciting stuff. Yeah, super exciting. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm thinking like, wow, that's like way too perfect that she was able to get that out of there. Like she's done a very good job of getting that thing out. And then she picks it up and just throws it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is junk. Yeah. In frustration. Oh, um, which, you know, someone else is probably going to stumble upon it and be like, ooh, what's this? <laughs> yeah. That was to show that, you know, she was frustrated that they've been working obviously hard enough and they haven't found anything super frustrated uh yeah. and this is our first time meeting a dr shannon and um she is an anthropologist slash archaeologist who is a no-nonsense go-getter who is in charge of this dig site and she is convinced that this dig site is the site of a neolithic campsite and man, she is going to prove it one way or another, come hell or high water. Yeah. And we might add that this woman is completely white bread. She's basically based off of a character from Jurassic Park. Yeah. She's the female version of. No, she's. Or she's like, just Laura no, Dern. No, no, no. She's, oh, she's Laura, Laura Dern's Dern. character. Oh, you're yeah. right. <laughs> you're right. Yeah, yeah. She is yeah. Laura Dern's character. Okay. So, for those of you who are wondering, the Neolithic period. This is our learning time. Um, is a period of prehistory that dates from about twelve thousand years ago to about sixty five hundred years ago. Just a sliver in time. If you're wondering what was happening during the Neolithic period in America, basically uh, people were coming up from uh, Central America and colonizing the Eastern U.S. And so they were probably traveling through Texas, and this might be one of the campsites from that. Other fun fact is that the term Neolithic is rarely used to describe North American dig sites. So her use of the term Neolithic might suggest that um, she should go back to school. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But the problem is that the earth is only 6,000 years old, Evan. So <laughs> I, I'm, dr I'm having some problem with some of your, some of your uh, <laughs> statements here. Funny you should mention that because <laughs> Chuck Norris actually ascribes to a form of creationism in oh which boy. in which uh, the Earth wouldn't have existed during the Neolithic period. So he wasn't really checking his facts either at the time, or he must have converted after this episode was written. I'd say the latter. What? Maybe a little bit of both. I don't know. <laughs> you think maybe no. maybe when uh, he met up with Gina, maybe they visited the uh, creationist museum in Kentucky. Maybe. I will also say in that interview, they were talking about consummating the marriage prior to the marriage. So, whoa, just, I think you know. he even admitted to it. Yeah, he, he yeah. did. He did. So, and uh, he actually had already had kids prior to. So, mm -hmm. well, technically, divorce is a sin. So, also punching people. Also having an extramarital affair that resulted in a child. Yeah. So, we're going I mean, there. We went there. Okay. All right. So, so Chuck, <laughs> Chuck, we're big fans. Chuck, we're big fans. We're just nearly state. We're stating the facts here, getting them out there. This is our 42nd podcast, and we're just now talking about this stuff. That's the respect we show. I'm sorry, but I will not apologize for believing in evolution either. So, getting that out there right now. Locking it in. Well, maybe we can evolve into getting back to the plot points here. Oh, okay? yes, of course. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Anywho, uh, Dr. Shannon is quite frustrated at the fact that she's found nothing at this dig site. And she's complaining to... Uh, I don't know what his job was. His job is obvious bad guy. That's his job. <laughs> like, yeah. immediately no, no, upon no. seeing him. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is Mendel, who's her, like, foreman on the job, who he's supposedly bringing in the labor. And it's like, she must have zero friends if she's commiserating to, to this yeah. guy and his response is like well maybe you're not digging in the right place and she's like no it's definitely here yeah so anyway she's confiding in this guy who's obviously a bad guy and just weaselly and 
classic walker great and uh i mean you're just like all right sweet and yeah. pretty much right off the bat these like are they broncos or what are they they, they start peeling in these with bad guys and they start <laughs> messing up the dig site and knocking over tents and all this stuff and you're like, just randomly shooting guns out there out, out of the truck windows oh, yeah. yep yep and we don't really see their faces per se, but nope. we know that they're causing destruction. And oh yeah, they're like cruising around, shooting guns around. They are running over tents, and uh, one of the trucks, uh, this GMC pickup truck, uh, backs into one of the tents. It's like it, they're like, well, we can't be bothered just to run over it from the front, so we just have to back into it. And as they back into it, there's a decal on the back window that says, "Ain't scared." <laughs> It's okay. in the style of no fear. Yeah. And oh. it's, it was a very it, common bumper sticker in my high school. Yeah. Like that one. <laughs> was ain't scared a common one oh, or totally. no fear? Yeah. I saw, no, I saw ain't scared all the time. Uh, like all the, really? oh, the pickup right. trucks. Oh yeah. It's great. Which is, makes it even better to see this here. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. That's a little time piece there. Just about as suddenly as they come in, they roll on out. And so they've caused a great deal of destruction uh, one guy seems slightly injured as he's helplessly crawling around on the ground. Next scene, Walker's there. And, you know, you may be wondering why Walker is at the Cherokee Nation, which is a good five or six hour drive from Dallas. And presumably in uh, Oklahoma? It's in uh, northeastern Oklahoma. So yeah. if, you, if you're curious about that, you're not going to learn that in this episode. There's no explanation as to why it's there. Right. We know <laughs> from watching other Walker episodes that, you know, that's where he was brought up by his Uncle Ray. Mm. So he, I guess, occasionally goes back to hang out. Solve crimes. Hopefully. We'll see if he does in this episode. But he is half Native American in real life as well, uh, we might add. Chuck Norris. At the crime scene, he uh, meets up with George Black Fox, who's uh, one of the deputies on the reservation, and his old friend Sam Coyote, who we've actually saw in Lucas. Right. Sam Coyote's a longtime friend of Walker, going back to when Walker first started living on the uh, reservation once his parents were killed. So, mm -hmm. And we might add that George Black Fox has an amazing black mullet. It I mean, is majestic. Fabulous moule. Majestic. Yeah. It's like they took a black foxtail and tied it into his existing hair. Mm. Oh, my gosh. It was pretty, uh, pretty on incredible. Point. On yeah. point. So, um, And Black Fox tells Walker that um, Sam Coyote's got the hots for Dr. Shannon. Like, He's fallen head over heels in love with Dr. Shannon. And so he's like, oh, well, let me take you to meet Dr. Shannon. Walker's like, okay, sure. And so he meets Dr. Shannon and she has this quote, which had to have been written by Chuck Norris himself. <laughs> totally. <laughs> which is, ah, Sam's told me all about you. 80% of which I couldn't believe it was so fantastic. <laughs> the remainder was simply incredible. I mean, that could be an epitaph for Walker right there. <laughs> so she's like, oh, well, you know, this has all been very traumatic, but uh, let's break for dinner. So <laughs> they go and hang out at some picnic table and drink out of some solo cups. And, you know, everyone's sort of giving their thoughts. Apparently, everyone in the cars was in war paint, which seems like a pretty thinly veiled uh, attempt to blame this vandalism on someone from within the reservation. Right, which we were kind of wondering, like, you know, sometimes when they do these digs, you know, Native Americans aren't too receptive to having outsiders come in and dig up their heritage. Oh, they actually say that the locals are totally fine with it. Sam Coyote and George Black Fox, they have pretty much ruled out anyone from the reservation. Yeah. Immediately. <laughs> they go as far as saying, oh, we've ruled out everyone from the reservation. It wasn't them. It was outsiders dressed as Native Americans trying to scare off Dr. Shannon. Probably. Just to play into that narrative, Jack Mendel, the bad guy, is all like, well, it's just a bunch of Indians getting liquored up and attacking us white eyes because of their problems. And there's just like this really awkward silence where <laughs> everyone just stares at him. <laughs> yeah. Every, like, uh, uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> 
I think it just cuts away at that point, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that night, Sam Coyote, he's got some visions. Bob, do you want to describe this vision here? Um, you know, it's kind of like a mountain t-shirt. Uh, oh, in some he's ways. so so a mountain t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, could, it could definitely be a mountain t-shirt. Uh, it appears as though he's getting married to Doctor Shannon in like some tribal ceremony, but kind of also very Anglo-Saxon kind of marriage too. The way they mm. speak. Uh, <laughs> and so. yeah, I think that's it. That's pretty much it, right? They get fake married, and then he wakes up. Uh, who's officiating the marriage, though? Uh, I didn't catch that. It sounds like Darth Vader. <laughs> I was gonna but. say like, um, what's the what's the dude James in uh, another dude in uh, Power Rangers, uh, Zordon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's someone voicing the Great Spirit who is officiating. Yeah. Um, Are they credited? It's not on the official list of cast or crew or anything. So if anyone knows who did the voice for the Great Spirit in this episode, we it was be. me. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, Sam Coyote, he's, he's imagining getting married to Dr. Shannon. We're like, man, okay, well, you know, he seems to be moving fairly fast, but you know, it's just a vision, but, uh, what is next- love? Hmm. <laughs> but the next morning, uh, we actually find out that he actually did propose to her that night. Yeah, um, so it's like it, it seems like they just met, and because of the vision, he knew she was his forever lover. Mm. So he popped the question, much to Black Fox and Walker's surprise. Really, they're kind of like, "Ooh, yeah." He's like, "Oh, we're engaged," and she's gonna she's gonna sleep on it and tell me tomorrow. <laughs> That's a good always sign. a good sign. Yeah, yeah. But he <laughs> seems in pretty good spirits still. It seems great. Yeah. I mean, if you have a vision that's going to happen and the, the great spirit is narrating it, you know it's going to happen, right? Mm, I don't know. It's Let's a, just say this wasn't one of Walker's visions. This was one of his visions. So Okay. If Sam Coyote wasn't reading it properly. Yeah, 50-50 saying? here. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I dug a little deeper into this episode on IMDb, and under sound department, I found a Foley artist. Oh, yes. Okay. Named, named James Bailey. Okay. So we'll just make a note. <laughs> we'll dig into that later and see what we come up with. Okay. I mean, that that would be a fully, I mean, uh, I don't know. I yeah. guess. Well, they might know, though, who it was, if not. Oh, totally. Yeah. It was James Bailey. <laughs> well, the Foley artist is definitely in charge of the stabbing sounds that we hear later on. So Yeah, yeah. Which are pretty epic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're getting ahead of ourselves slightly here. So then it cuts to the next morning, and she just says, yeah, no. Right. Yeah. yeah and it's like she's like smiling it's like, it's like super harsh yeah. she's like i can't possibly be tied down by anybody and let's just accept what it was right let's accept what it was and you know i can't possibly be tied down in my career which at this point her career is failing to find a dig site that everyone knows is there <laughs> Mm, right yeah and, and, and mm. yeah she puts them down pretty harshly because obviously they got it's together. super harsh they it's, got together it's really harsh yeah and she told him that she loved him at one point in time so yeah. it's like just immediately giving him the cold shoulder dr shannon's got some sick pillow talk that's what we learn here she's ice cold yeah but you got to be if you're a scientist because you're taking in all those facts mm. and all those latin names right evan I don't think she's doing many Latin names. She's an anthropologist. Okay. But she kind of so, was a biologist. Almost, homo too. sapiens. When it comes to Sam Coyote, she got into a little biology as well. It's more anatomy. I don't know if that's part of biology, but. Yeah. Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's unpack that. Um, <laughs> geez. So, you know, obviously, Sam Coyote, he's taking this pretty hard because it's pretty brutal, right? And yeah. not only that, she's like turning him down in front of everyone, including Mendel and his boys, and they're all like snickering. Yeah, all the bad guys are like, oh, what a loser. And then Walker and George Blackfox are there too, and they also overhear this, and she like just dresses him down in front of everybody, ice cold, and Walker kind of comes over and says, Sam, let's get out of here and talk about this. Mm. And I never thought that I'd see Walker talk about love. <laughs> <laughs> he, he knows all. 
He knows all. Walker and George earlier were like talking about how Sam Coyote gets very attached. A little mm-hmm. clingy. That's yeah. kind of what I yeah. took from that conversation. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And we're seeing it. So, you know, they have this whole intervention. Walker's all like, you know, it takes time to heal. And Sam's like, well, I just need to go talk to her one more time. And they're like, no, 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 no. No. We just... Right. We just we just saw you get destroyed right there. Like it's not going to get any better, buddy. You just gotta <laughs> you just gotta let this one go. But he can't. He said, "What would you do?" He's like, "If you're in love, you got to follow your heart." And they just let him go, and they're like, "Oh man." Yeah. Cut to definitely a crazy transition in this episode, but it's like an extreme zoom on a face. The, the they one? brought in they brought in the foley artist for this one with whooshes. Oh yeah. <laughs> and it cuts to the Dallas skyline and we see the Silver Ridge oil and minerals on a sign on the wall. That's when we know the crux of this episode because as we've learned from prior episodes including a Rainbow Warrior, Cherokee Nation must be sitting on like the greatest oil sands ever because they're constantly under attack by uh, developers. <laughs> in an attempt to drill the hell out of the reservation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We hear two people talking. Yeah. And it kind of pans up from, like, this conference table to people talking in the background. And before we see them, we know that one of the guys talking is the snivelly bad guy, Mendel. Really? Unbelievable. I couldn't I couldn't yeah. believe it. I couldn't believe that he was a bad guy. Yeah. They didn't even really build up the suspense of revealing him because it's literally like one scene and then they reveal he's a bad guy. But we already knew he was a bad guy. Anyway, so he's talking to, I guess, his boss about this whole oil deal. He's like, oh, we found there's a ton of oil there, but we're going to have to get rid of the archaeologist. The boss is like, we got to get her out of the picture. And Mendel's like, I got this. This is when I expected him to say like, oh, yeah, I've been smashing every artifact i find or i've been like sabotaging the dig in some way but no no not even <laughs> that much she's finesse just, she's just real bad at her job yeah, apparently yeah <laughs> well she's been busy you know kind of uh she's been getting local knowledge <laughs> there you go okay <laughs> oh man and then yeah then she's not, she doesn't even appreciate it come on no no guy goes down and he proposes to you you dress yeah. him down in front of all your, your worker buddies? Come on. Yeah. Ice cold. It's not cool. Dr. Shannon drives past Black Fox and Sam Coyote to get some gas in their super cool Jeep. And she doesn't even make eye contact with Sam Coyote. And that really... That's brutal. You know, it yeah. really upsets him. And so he just walks over to try to talk to her. And she's just even more of a jerk. And then a bunch of the guys from the dig site are there and they start <laughs> saying things that are like, like first off, really like rude. And then just like straight up like racist, racist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, and then she's like, Dr. Shannon said nothing, nothing right. at so, all. So you're like, is she a bad guy? Apparently so. Right. She's a, in my eyes in this episode, she's a bad guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Yep. Anyways, things come to blows, and they have a little scuffle there in front of the gas station. Right. And Black Fox and Sam Coyote are kicking some butt out there because Black Fox he's a beast. Right about this point, I'm like, you know what? This is a shakedown, and Walker should be here. Pull, up, look at my watch. Then we see a shot of the truck rumbling up the street. Walker, of course, has been hanging out with Judge Five Kills, which is like the greatest name ever, <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> Walker and Judge Five Kills, they come out of the truck and basically lay down the law. Five Kills is an interesting window into the legal system of a Native American reservation and that I guess he has jurisdiction and the authority to sort of uh, sentence people for what he sees fit. And he does some sentencing, laying down the law, and he basically tells everyone that they all have to donate to the local food shelter, like 20 bucks. (laughs) <laughs> right. Even though they kind of chided Sam Coyote, he charges Sam Coyote more money than everybody else. He says, you threw the first punch, even though I understand why you did, you have to throw down 50 bucks. Pretty big punishment. I mean, if you think about it, like 20 bucks is a lot of gas in 1998. And think of how many ringdings they could have got at the convenience store. 
if they hadn't gotten into that fight. Can we talk about some of the, the goon squad here? There's that one guy with the blonde hair that looks... He's like, you know... <laughs> is that the guy from Silverchair? Is, that the, <laughs> yeah, is this the right year? Right. <laughs> There's one scene when he, later when he's driving, and I was just like, was like, oh, the Nirvana definitely came on the radio when he turned that thing on, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah this is a particularly awesome goon squad. They've got a hell of an attitude. Yeah, a oh, stacked roster. Everyone, all of them are just like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, great. so much plaid. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. The plaid it was just Nirvana plaid. Yeah. Oh, yeah, done. Each pair of jeans has a 14-inch zipper, at least. <laughs> As they're leaving, Dr. Shannon says to Judge Five Kills, you need to make sure that, you know, Sam Coyote stops his advances on me. And it's like, okay, now she's making it public to the judge now? Like, come on. What is going on here? She's yeah, just, because obviously it was consensual before, but now, I don't know. Out of nowhere. Now, I'm going to create some backstory. Dr. Mm. Shannon... Wait, is this okay. fanfic? Are we yep. gonna get in the fanfic right now. Ter- right okay. now. Dr. Shannon, she is a tragic <laughs> character in that she was actually married to another anthropologist, but he died on a dig after an, a freak raptor attack. Pickaxe accident. Oh, okay. mm. And because of that, she's never forgiven herself, and she's too afraid to get close to people because she doesn't want to get hurt again. Ooh. Okay. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Is the stenographer on? Are we getting this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we don't have one. Yeah. yeah. Or she's just ice cold and, you know. Choose your own adventure here. Yeah. Anywho, uh, so, you know, they're like, let's just cool down. We'll have a cool uh, dinner with the bros. Black Fox is cooking. He's cooking up some linguine and clams, um, which, right. you know, he's talking about creating his own cooking show called the Cherokee Gourmet. And he's telling Walker all about this. I'll say right now, if that dude does a cooking show, I'm watching. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Count me in. 100% Count me in. in. Too. He could, yeah. Well, only if he has that awesome mullet, I would be. <laughs> I mean, I'd watch anything he does. That said, would I want to eat any sort of clam that has been shipped to northeastern Oklahoma? Probably not. Probably but, passing uh, that one. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it might be clams that were preserved in rock that they uh, actually discovered. <laughs> In the dig? Yeah, that Dr. Shannon did not. Oh, uh, she missed them. <laughs> exactly. So She's obviously terrible at her job. Yeah. They're probably rehydrated clams from, you know, <laughs> generations before. So Black Fox is about to serve up his linguine and clam sauce. Walker doesn't run away because he's pretty much immune to anything. But Sam yeah. Coyote's like, I'm not hungry. I'm going to go visit. White Eagle, right? Who we saw in the episode Lucas, a tribal elder who wears Reebok sneakers. Yeah, White Eagle's I awesome. I think they were Nikes, weren't they? Okay, well, you know. He was given to them by some dude in LA. That's the backstory there. Um, <laughs> so apparently, White Eagle just hangs out in the woods and people go and see him when they need some guidance. And that's mm-hmm. what Sam Coyote was going to do uh, in the middle of the night and probably made the right call turning down those clams. I think so. Cut to the dig site, and as with most archaeological <laughs> dig sites, I guess, the main investigator sleeps alone <laughs> at the dig site every night. Dr. Shannon's just chilling in her tent all by yeah. herself. She left a few flaps open in case, you know, Coyote wanted to visit one more time. Want to dig on the site? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. She's just asleep in her tent. And someone walks in. We don't know who it is. This is all filmed from the point of view of the person yeah, and she's breaking like, and entering. What, what, what are you doing here? And a gloved hand reached down over her mouth and smothers her while we hear a juicy sound that must be her getting stabbed. We don't see it, but we sure do we hear that. Mm. So the Foley yeah. artist, they're on point. What do you think? Like a wet bag of semi-thawed <laughs> chicken thighs. That's what it sounds like to me. In a plastic bag. It. Probably canned clams. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been it, yeah. So she gets killed, and we're like, could it be Coyote? Could he do this? Would he be getting revenge for being turned down? All right, now, if this show were more skillfully framed, there almost would be some mystery involved with it. Right. And I kind right. of appreciate the fact that they're, like, trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
But no one is ever convinced that Sam Coyote actually did it. So right. there's really no point in disguising who did it in the show. Right. Maybe if they had a little bit more time, they could have angled it to make the viewer think that Coyote might have done it. Yeah. A little bit more compelling than kind of no stakes. Yeah. The way this yeah. episode feels because they didn't do that. But anyway, maybe he did kill her. Let's find out. Yeah. So next day, Walker's called in again. He just heads on down to the crime scene and meets up with Black Fox. And Black Fox is leaving the tent with a, a knife in a Ziploc bag. Walker just immediately doesn't even look at the body or anything. He's just like, that's a murder weapon. Black Fox is like, yep. And they're like, okay, we don't have to look at the crime scene or anything. At this point, our buddy Mendel comes out and he's like, well, we know who killed her. We know exactly who killed her. Walker ignores him and then is like, does he have an alibi? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Which his alibi, ironclad. It's yeah. uh, hanging out with all the other sketchy guys. Yeah, playing <laughs> poker with his buds. <laughs> He has an alibi, so Walker can't immediately arrest him or do anything like that. Yeah, so they go back to um, Sam's house, and Sam has just gotten back from, um, you know, spending a night out along the river with, they think, White Eagle, but uh, actually come to find out, he never actually found White Eagle, so he just hung out there alone. Yeah, and Sam's like, you know what? I feel so much better having just gone out and slept under the stars and it's really not that big a deal that she turned me down and doesn't want to marry me and and whatever and oh what what walker what what's wrong walker <laughs> yeah she did yeah. <laughs> what she's dead <laughs> and you can kind of see the way he acted it you could tell that he was really hurt that she was dead because he did care about her so not that they thought that he killed him, but it was evident that he didn't kill her from that portrayal. So, good on you, Sam. Mm-hmm. Back at the crime scene, the uh, FBI is showing up, which... Wh- why not? Why just, is the know. FBI there? I guess they had, like, some FBI prop jackets lying around, and they're just like, yeah, okay, it's the FBI. So, the FBI shows up. All the goons just say, you got to look into this guy, Sam Coyote. And all the people in the FBI are just like, Okay, yeah, we'll we'll check it out, yeah. and uh, <laughs> and they just leave the crime scene. Now, I will say the head uh, FBI agent is played by a guy Brent Anderson. He is a uh, stalwart not only for five episodes of Walker Texas Ranger, including the pilot, but also in over ten episodes of Wishbone. Oh, and I thought okay. I'd recognize him. Another Wishbone That's because connection. it was around yeah. the same period of time as Wishbone. Yeah, he plays one of the musketeers in the three in the Mutketeer episode. I recall that one. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> classic. So you know the FBI is like, well, we don't need to investigate anything. So let's just go pick this guy up, I guess. And uh, just like as they're leaving. <laughs> Mendel pulls out his brick of a cell phone and uh, calls up his boss and is like, yeah, just so you know, nothing has been accomplished yet, but it's in the works. <laughs> yeah. And this phone call is going to cost you 50 bucks. <laughs> right, right. This is a sat phone. So I, I called collect. <laughs> then he's like, yeah, contact the tribe about the leases right away it's like what <laughs> yeah they kind of don't go into fleshing out that plot line because well, it almost doesn't matter right well it's like at this point they don't have any reason to suspect that guy really mm. but now they're like no let's immediately lease out this property that the dig was on for oil like well they could just oh well somebody who's guilty wouldn't do that right away right or, you mm-hmm. know, right, not no, guilty, not. they wouldn't think about it. So they could argue the other way. Clearly they would, I guess. Okay. All right. <laughs> Walker hears that the FBI's on the scene, and he's like, oh, crap. Well, if the FBI's here, they're going to try to arrest Sam, and then Sam's going to be tried off the reservation by a jury of white people. And, you know, Black Fox is like, no offense, Walker, but if he's tried by white people, he's going away. And uh, Black Fox is not wrong. Because we didn't mention the murder weapon was Coyote's actual knife that was missing from his Jeep. Mm -hmm. And um, he doesn't have an alibi. The murder weapon is his own knife. So, yeah, I mean, 
I could mm. see why he would be going away. Walker comes up with a clever ruse of, well, if you arrest him, Black Fox, that means he's on uh, under custody at the reservation and the FBI can't rearrest him for the same crimes. So they basically preemptively arrest Sam Coyote just as the FBI is showing up. And the FBI is pissed about this. Which, again, why? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, we just wanted to arrest somebody and bring them off the reservation. Like, we have no evidence here except for what a bunch of skeezy bystanders said. We didn't work at the crime scene, so we have no evidence whatsoever. Uh, we just had this one guy we're just going to bag for this murder and get out of here. That seems to be their MO. I'm not going to try to argue the logic of the FBI, Evan, and I don't think you should either. Mm. Anyways... Sam Sam Coyote's got to spend the night in jail, and he has the most excellent dream sequence. This one amps up the previous dream <laughs> sequence by like a hundred. Well, yeah. first let's say it's basically the same one until about you know two thirds of the way through. Just a little bit of a twist. He's having the wedding again. There's the narrator who is <laughs> in even more crazy. I think I only recognized there was a narrator in the second one. James Earl Jones. Yeah, he's dude, like essentially It's saying, the great spirit, dude. <laughs> the great spirit's telling Sam Coyote that this is the woman of his dreams and all this stuff and a lot of reverb on it. And you're just like, what is going on? And he's like, do you take this woman? Do you take this man? And they kiss and they kiss in the previous flashback, too. And it was like. They're going in for it. It's like, open mouth. It is. Open mouth, for it sure. is. Yeah. You know, this yeah. isn't a kiss you're used to seeing on Walker. This is like... Or even in a wedding, really. It's... <laughs> right. It's full on, <laughs> full on make-out sesh. <laughs> yeah. So they're like, you know, they're laying into it. But uh, this one, as uh, Bob said, we see the uh, ending of this kiss in which <laughs> Dr. Shannon makes a uh, crazy <laughs> screeching noise and... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Sam uh, pulls back, uh, recoils in terror <laughs> as it's apparent that his lip has been bitten by Dr. Shannon, who is now transmorphing into a zombie woman. <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> Yeah, and at this point he wakes up and I'm real sad you know like when you have a really good dream and then like you wake up it's like come on I just want to like go back to sleep and get into that but let me tell you I was hoping he'd fall back asleep so I could see the conclusion of this one like yeah what I mean, what is going on here <laughs> maybe what happened was if the first time he had that dream if he didn't wake up early he wouldn't have proposed mm. Mm. that's true yeah, that's so true that's a lesson for listeners out there always get a good night's sleep Mm. Mm. Gotta get your eight hours. Mm. <laughs> so the next morning, uh, they're like, well, you know, we've only got a limited period of time. And Sam, you're stuck here in prison. You can't help us find this. And he just says, Walker, go get him. <laughs> <laughs> and those are the words we've been waiting for this whole episode. Because right. Walker has been like sidelined. Pretty much. Yeah. And he's just like, all right. <laughs> and we're like, okay. All right. <laughs> So he goes to uh, visit the campsite slash murder scene, which, you know, this is the next day, right? Yeah. Of a murder, which apparently is high profile enough to bring the FBI in. And the crew who were like her field techs and whatever, they're all breaking down the tents and everything. Yeah. Pack it up. Right. So <laughs> it's like, gotta get so like oil. this isn't possible. <laughs> this couldn't possibly be a crime scene. Yet it is. And he's like, okay, I'm just sort of getting my bearings here. And he's like, okay, I've got to investigate this guy who's obviously a bad guy, Jack Mandel, because he's thinking back to all the things that Jack Mandel has said. Oh, there was actually a flashback of there all were the flashbacks he here. Yep. <laughs> you know, so in case we've forgotten that Jack Mandel is obviously a bad guy, yeah. um, you know, we have some flashbacks just for people who are just joining in on the episode. So then he jumps in his car and he calls up tech support, i.e. Trevet. Trevet's upset that he's been relegated to tech support and we hadn't seen him the whole episode. Also, I don't think we see Alex or CD this whole episode, right? Nope. nope. Yeah. Nope. So hopefully they had a good week off for this episode. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, so Trevet was used pretty sparingly here too. 
So he pretty much asked Trebet, hey, can you look this guy up? I don't have any evidence, but I've just got, you know, I've got a feeling. And what does Trevet said? I've learned never to doubt your Cherokee intuition. <laughs> I'll just look right on into that. Yeah. Yeah. So Walker six him on looking up information on Jack Mendel, who apparently is based out of a town called Seton, Texas, which according to Trevet is just over the Oklahoma border. This is not true, though. <laughs> no? I looked it up. Seton, Texas does exist, but it is down just north of Austin. So it would be like an eight-hour drive from there to the reservation. Okay. Well, they didn't really have Google Maps yet. I guess. No, but they had regular maps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so back in court. Five kills is able to delay some things. The FBI agents are in there and they're trying to... Um, Playing hardball and they're like, look, we can usurp your jurisdiction here. It just might take us a little bit. Five kills. He kind of plays hardball. They leave and he says to Walker and Black Fox, you know they're right. They can come back here with a writ tomorrow and take away Coyote. So you boys better act fast. So Walker, he gets out on the case and he's all like, okay, I'm going to Seton figure out what the heck's going on. He calls Trevette, and Trevette's like, oh, yeah, I, I'm still working on this guy, but seems like he's got this company, and he's in some sort of oil dealings, and, you know, it seems like bad news. Maybe I should come out and be your backup now. And Walker's like, no, I still need you to do more work. Why don't you find a paper trail between this oil company and Mendel? And Trevette's like, yeah, that seems like a tall order. But I guess I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. And Walker goes in for a, a little bit of a shakedown here. And this is really when the episode gets spicy. <laughs> it is. Yeah. And it kind of goes against what normally happens at a Walker shakedown. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah so for sure. Eventually. Yeah, yeah. So Walker pulls up to where all the bad guys are hanging out. And Mondell's there, kind of the ringleader of all the other bad goons. And Walker says, hey, I got the name of your boss. And when we approach him with these charges, he's going to turn on you immediately. Yeah. And yeah. so Mendel's like, get him, boys. And then all the guys <laughs> just like start start going after Walker. Usually it's one at a time, so Walker can just take him out easily. Mm. But they overpower Walker. I know, there are too yeah. many of them. He gets a few good moves in before that happens, though. Yeah. He's got like one on each side. He's like headbutts one guy and... <laughs> punches the other guy it was good there was some, there was some good it stuff was, in there. it was pleasurable yeah, yeah. yeah until he gets he gets kicked in the face and then he's out yeah and they're like well now what do we do with him and they're like well throw him in the back of the truck and drive him out to the badlands take him out 152 east and make it look like an accident so the guy that's like kurt cobain with the blonde <laughs> hair and he's in his flannel shirt they throw walker in the back of walker's own truck and Kurt yeah, Cobain yeah. gets in the front seat. And yeah. you're like, what? Yeah, what this is, is happening? sacrilege here. Yeah, he's handcuffed behind his back and in someone else is truck. driving his truck. But they got to make it look like an accident. They drive off with Walker in tow in the back of his own truck. And you're like, wow, maybe they'll kill Walker. No, well, no. <laughs> so Trevette has been trying to call Walker and Walker's not returning his calls. So Trevette hops in the car and drives five and a half hours apparently in 20 minutes and he's like okay I'm, I'm heading up to Seton to see what the heck's going on he calls Black Fox and he's like I don't know it's weird uh, I hadn't heard from Walker and he was headed to Seton and Black Fox is like okay I'll meet you there and he hangs up Sam Coyote's all like what's going on you know is Walker in trouble and Black Fox is like that was his partner on the phone and he hasn't talked to him and that's not like Walker to leave his partner hanging and we, yeah, we, we Walker, Walker watchers, we know better. It's like, yeah, he does that all the time. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Um, he's usually fine. But the best part is, like, <laughs> Coyote's like, take me with you. If anything were to happen to Walker, you need me to help you out, too. And Judge Five Kills is like, well, I can't hear any of this. You know, uh, I don't, you know, I... I'm an officer of the court. You know? Right. I can't be here <laughs> if you're going to just break Coyote out. He's already arrested under our jurisdiction here, so let me just go outside and, yeah, you you boys just drive safe. Yeah, have fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The plea for it, though, from uh, Sam Coyote was, 
Remember how it always used to be? Coyote and Fox. Fox and Coyote. We got this. And there was one other. There was Washoe. Oh, and it's like in reference okay. to Walker, yeah, yeah, and you know, I'm thinking, okay, this is super badass, right? And then the two of them, they get the go ahead from five kills. They run out of the courthouse, <laughs> jump into this sick jeep, right? And they have with their guns, guns with yeah. their guns, and they cruise off. And I'm like, this is the spinoff we really need. Oh yeah, <laughs> fox and coyote. Come on now. Yeah, that would have been awesome. And the FBI is just kind of waiting outside, and they're like, "Oh, what? Where are they? Where? Oh, the coyote. Oh, well, let's go after him." So, yeah. isn't that guy under arrest? <laughs> yep. Yep. We'll go back to Walker, and he's in the back of the truck, and he comes to, and he's covered with like a cloth. He's handcuffed behind his back, and what he does is. Maybe physically impossible, definitely physically impossible for a 50-something-year-old Chuck Norris, which is that he passes his handcuffed arms <laughs> behind his back under his legs so that his hands are in front of him, but still handcuffed. Okay, mm. okay. You know, Chuck Norris, he's a flexible guy. Total gym, man. He's covered in the back of his truck, and the two kind of redneck goons get out, the one who's like Kurt Cobain, uh, with the blonde hair, <laughs> And uh, he pulls the sheet off, and Walker is facing them, waiting. Before you know it, two boots shoot out and hit both of the two guys on the truck bed's faces. <laughs> they fall to the ground unconscious. And another guy scrambles over to the side of the truck to see what was happening and immediately gets a boot to the side of the head. Oh, my and, gosh. Uh, yeah. And the, those guys dispatched oh. in, like, half a second. It was awesome. It was so good. <laughs> So he just ties them up in the back of his truck and just drives off. It's like nothing to it. I guess he's driving back to the headquarters. Right, where we assume he'll meet up with Trevette, who's headed over there, and with Coyote and Fox, who are headed over there, right. and with the FBI, who are all headed over there. So, And I thought they would get there before Walker, didn't you? Yeah, which is what makes this next scene so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> back at the bad guy's headquarters they hear this like roaring engine and we think oh it's got to be the jeep with coyote and fox in it and instead we see the gray dodge ram come out from around a corner (laughs) and take a jump off of some random object and propel itself through the air towards the bad guys (laughs) just totally wrecking that truck (laughs) just for no reason totally unnecessary (laughs) Oh, it was necessary. Well, it's for us. Absolutely. For the, revenge, the man. This is yeah. revenge. The jump is revenge. <laughs> Pure <laughs> and simple. Yeah, Walker's like, dude, I'm coming in hot with this Dodge Ram. By the way, I didn't think about this. When he did that massive jump, those bad guys must have fallen out the back, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if they were still in the back of that truck... It's not oh, like man. they secured them anyway. <laughs> they don't oh, have my a spine just anymore. Rolled out. <laughs> I totally <laughs> Yeah, those guys are so dead. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> so he kind of pulls into the bad guy compound, and then it's kind of just classic Walker. He flies into the bad guy compound. <laughs> yeah, he did he launches truck himself. Fly. Yeah. <laughs> and it, he's kind of like, gets out, and people are firing at him, and he scatters, and this is like Walker at his finest here. Oh, yeah, scampering around some industrial wasteland with bad guys in flannel shirts trying to get him. And he's just, like, punching them around corners and stuff. And one guy kind of follows him with a gun, and Walker, like, walks through this long pipe, right? And the bad guy kind of scampers behind him with a gun, and he's looking through the pipe, and he's like, where's Walker? Where's Walker? And he gets to the end of the pipe and walks out and takes a few steps forward, and Walker drops down behind him. Like, he had enough time to run through the pipe and climb up on top of the pipe to jump down behind this bad guy. It was just awesome takeout. Classic. I think there was a round the bend in this one. Definitely. One or two, (laughs) yeah. For sure. For listeners out there, round the bend is when Walker's fist or boot just comes around a corner and takes out a bad guy. Oh, yeah. Meanwhile, while this siege is happening, Coyote and Fox show up on the scene And this is, I think, the most ridiculous part in this episode, or at least one of the craziest things I've seen a stunt person do in this episode. Coyote and Fox 
come roaring into this compound and there there's a guy with a gun and he like stands in the middle of this dirt road and is like pretending to fire at them and you know they pretend to duck and then as the jeep gets right up on the guy he like pretends to jump out of the way but the jeep definitely hits him definitely like, clipped him good 100 yeah. percent, and he goes down hard <laughs> and like really fast oh god <laughs> uh, not only that but did you notice when he was still on the ground there was another car that came by and like came what looked like within inches of running this guy over <laughs> oh man <laughs> oh no yep yeah you know you got so. it on film you might as well use it well, yeah. it's one take, right? <laughs> yeah, it'd be a waste if they didn't use it. Yeah, so that guy... Props. Yeah, pr- I, I guess. I guess. Yeah. Hopefully he can walk. I, so. It just, so Coyote and Fox pull up on the scene like that, and they just start opening fire on these bad guys who are opening fire on them. And then not soon after, the FBI pulls up behind them. And granted, the FBI should be arresting Coyote, right? Mm, yep that's why they're following coyote and they just pull up and the lead guy's like oh so we're just firing at them because they're firing at us they're like yep so he (laughs) he just starts opening fire too now that right there that's the witty banter you expect from fox and coyote that's what you'd get in a fox and coyote show i'd watch that show yeah i would too 100 percent. not soon after that trevette shows up and he starts shooting at the people too he had to get in on the fun a little bit so oh yeah and just like with a lot of these sort of gun battles, eventually one bad guy ends up falling over, and that's like the pivotal bad guy at some point, and everyone else just gives up. <laughs> oh, all right. They're like, oh, okay, I guess I'll stop now. Like, I don't know. Um, so they give up, and uh, they're you they're got um, me. you know they, they they turn themselves in, all except for Mendel, who's trying to sneak away into his car, and Walker's tracking him down. Mm. And uh, Walker <laughs> shouts at him, but he gets in his car first. And I'm thinking, okay, this is setting itself up for, like, Walker jumping through the windshield or doing right, something right. else. <laughs> and then you see the shot, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the camera shot, and you're like, oh, I know what's, I know what's happening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, you're like, this is going to be an epic super shot. So Walker's going to pull his gun. The car is coming down fast on him, approaching. Him, <laughs> and... He's going to fire one shot, and the thing's just going to erupt in the flames. And that's exactly what happens. Except this might be the best super shot we've ever seen. Right? <laughs> I don't know. No. I, mean, he shoots, I, I he shoots still the one in the neighbor. The one in the neighborhood is too yeah, good. Because it's like, <laughs> you could talk to a mechanic, and they couldn't even tell you a spot that you could shoot in the hood of a car where it would just explode like that. But, like, this one, he shoots, I don't know, presumably a tire or something, and then the car careens towards a jump, which then (laughs) blows it up. Exactly. It jumps in the air. Yeah. For some reason, it explodes as it hits the jump, (laughs) but not when it lands. Then it lands upside down. But the best part about this one was the car does all that, and it flips over. It's upside down, and Walker is able to run up to the car and get the bad guy out so that he can get his man before it explodes spectacularly behind them as Walker hauls him off to justice. When I saw that car flip over in flames, I was thinking, boy, I really hope Trevette got a paper trail because they're never going to get this guy into court. (laughs) Right, yeah. (laughs) But fortunately, as Adam said, Walker rips the door off the car and rescues Mendel just before the car explodes spectacularly. Is that how it ends? How's it? Uh, no, th- th- I had in the notes, Walker and Trevette are driving away in his pickup and you hear like Walker basically ripping on Trevette. I don't even remember what they're talking about. I think it was, it was like, like, you need a backup. And he's like, no, I yeah, didn't. Yeah. Uh, or something like that. But yeah. At the scene of the shootout, Trevette's like, you just leave me behind. And I'm just doing all this computer stuff and I could be helping you out instead of doing all the hard stuff. And Walker points to his face, which has like a bloody lip. And he's like, you think this was easy? Case in point. You could have used me as backup. Right. And Trevette's <laughs> like, uh, and Walker's like, cat got your tongue. Oh, God. Which, it's like, <laughs> like, it's like that what, what is go- what is okay. going on? <laughs> so then it yeah, flashes to them in the truck and they're driving off at the end of the episode. And, and Walker's like, well, I might take a computer class for you or something like that. And Trevette's like, yo, you do that for me? And Walker's like, nah. <laughs> End of episode. <laughs> <Ba-dum-bum>. yep. <laughs> yep. 
computers are evil. He's not wrong. He isn't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that about sums up this episode. We'd love to give a shout out to our friend and collaborator, Adam Lauritsen, who's been drawing the amazing walkerstrations on our social media. Be sure to check out his other art on Instagram at adimaginationrunamuck. When we come back, it'll be time for us to each rate tribe on a scale of 0 to 10 boots to the face, resulting in our patented Roundhouse Roulette episode ranking, the complete results of which are available on our website, roundhouseroulette.com. Don't go away. Brother Bob has been at it again, Evan. I fear he's in love with another traveling saleswoman. Oh, he doth give his heart too easy. Oh, shh, here he comes now. OCO, brothers. You seem to be floating on the air. That I am, Washo. May it please you to hear that I have just proposed to Tammy. When she knocked on my trailer door, it sent shockwaves through my heart, and I knew we were meant to be together forever. Tupperware, Tammy? The same. I now, too, have a full set with which to refrigerate my excess eel. She told me she'd give her answer after she ran my credit card. Speaking of which, I best go receive my bride-to-be's response. See you later, brothers. This is not going to end well. While we anxiously await Tammy's response, it's my duty to inform you that we here at Roundhouse Roulette have pledged to deliver the light of Walker, Texas Ranger to the world. If you'd like to join us on that mission, please share the pod with a friend or leave us a kind review on Apple Podcasts. It truly helps other Walkerites find the cast. If you'd like to further support the show, be sure to check out our fine apparel and vintage action figures at roundhouseroulette.com. Or join the fun on our Patreon page. Most importantly, though, we thank you for listening. She said yes! Oh, great spirit, behold me. We're gonna have a wedding at last. And our leftovers will never spoil again! May this be a lesson to us to wear our hearts on our sleeves forevermore. Now get the heck out of here, podcast listener. You've got a show to get back to. (laughs) (laughs) Chortle, chortle. (laughs) Welcome back. This is a tough one because I would say the first half to three fifths of this episode were a dud, but it renegade meat packs a ton into the uh, <laughs> into the back half. Yeah, into the last like eight minutes of this episode is just fire. <laughs> <laughs> you get you get the shakedown, which you know is going to be great. He gets kidnapped, escapes. It's like not a, it's like an, a mild inconvenience for him to be kidnapped. <laughs> it's like not even. You know, <laughs> Gets out of that, you know, and then truck jumps, car flips, <laughs> explosions, super shots. Uh, Takes up bad guys in like uh, zombies, you know. All right. I mean, the episode's pretty dang ridiculous. That said, like, just the first part is just so tedious and <laughs> like so expected too. Like, none of it is uh, surprising. It's like so obvious too that like they can gloss over a ton of the plot points because they're like oh yeah people just assume that's the case and it is (laughs) (laughs) right right uh so that said like i think i'm gonna give it like a seven because if someone were new to walker i'd want them to see that last bit at least it's like so over the top for all the same reasons it's really hard for me to go really high on this one definitely worth a watch so over five has some crazy awesome stuff in it. The double boot to the face from the back of the truck. Mm. Mm. I, I can't go. I got to go six. Yeah, I had six on my notes for this one, too. If you had the second half or maybe even the last third of the episode and you did that for the other two thirds of the episode as well, we're looking at a 10, you know? Mm, yeah, <laughs> it really would so be. So maybe yeah. six is even two. <laughs> Too generous, you think? Yeah, but it, during those other two thirds, that's kind of where we had the weird zombie flashbacks, and there was some like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was some ridiculous uh, banter. But yeah, so yeah, that's why I went six. It's definitely one of those episodes where if you're watching with someone, you're like, oh, just wait, it's gonna get even more ridiculous, <laughs> <laughs> and it will. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that gives this episode a roundhouse rating of six point six 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 boots to the face. And uh, I think we can all agree that Black Fox and Coyote is the spinoff series that we all deserve. Oh, yeah. 
But please let us know what you think on social media or by emailing us at roundhouseroulette at gmail.com. When we come back, we'll spin that Roundhouse Roulette wheel and select our next episode. And we're back. Bob, you ready to spin that thing? Oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> plague. <laughs> okay. Nice. Season 5, Episode 5, Plague. This might hit a little too close to home. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Volatile experiments being performed on a nearby farm put the residents of a Cherokee reservation in mortal danger. <laughs> back to the res, guys. <sighs> it looks like we're, yeah, it looks like we're going back. So. And we spend a lot of time out there, so... Yep. Well, we're getting he should, he should be here. Walker, Oklahoma Ranger. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> we hope you'll join us next time when we share our reactions to Season 5, Episode 5, Plague. In the meantime, share your opinions with us on Facebook and on Instagram at, at Roundhouse Roulette and on Twitter at, at Roundhouse Pod. And rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your fine podcasts. Thanks for listening. And until next time, be may the eyes of the Ranger be upon you. When you're in Texas, look behind you. Oh, because that's where the Ranger's going to be.